Okay, this is the third, I believe, session we are having on cochlear physiology, inner ear physiology. Rather complex, rather strange stuff. Let's just make sure we've got our ground covered here. I will share a screen and we'll find out where we are. Last week we did a general, just a general coverage of things. So we pulled up a PowerPoint here. We'll pull up our notes over here. Good stuff. Going from the top, purpose of vestibular system to give your brain information as to regarding your balance or position of body in space. Purpose of inner ear is to change mechanical energy into electrical energy. Here's something we need to get good and straight. The ear is a series of transducers. And as we say, transducers are things that change energy from one form into another form. So, a microphone is a transducer. It changes sound waves into electricity. A speaker is a transducer. It's a backward mic. It changes electricity back into sound. The ear is a series of various transducers. The middle ear changes sound waves into mechanical energy. The cochlea changes that mechanical energy into hydraulic up and down energy. In other words, a transverse wave. Sound waves in air are longitudinal. Compression, rarefaction, compression, rarefaction. Water waves go up and down, and the up and down of a water wave is perpendicular to its movement going left or right. Okay? So the ear, basically, the middle ear changes sound waves, squeezing, separating of molecules, condensation, rarefaction, condensation, rarefaction. Those are called longitudinal waves. Those are changed into mechanical piston-like energy with the stapes pushing in and out of the oval window. The cochlea takes that mechanical energy and changes it into transverse waves, like water waves. Water waves going like this, but also moving in a direction. And those transverse waves in the cochlea are called traveling waves. The hair cells change the traveling wave action into electricity. So you've got sound into mechanical energy into transverse water wave-like energy into electrical energy. So cochlea takes mechanical energy, changes it into a traveling wave, and the hair cells take that traveling wave and they change that into electricity. So that's a rather interesting little device we've got here. All right, back over to the notes. Hair cells, weird, specialized cells partly between a nerve cell and a skin cell. Pilloried, as we said last week, held tight around the neck so that the hairs are touching one type of fluid and the body of the hair cell is touching another part of the fluid, a different part of fluid. Let us look at our notes here on our PowerPoint. And what we'll highlight here is this. Wherever the traveling wave has a peak, You've got a bending of the entire scala media. You can see here your tectorial membrane, your outer hair cells here, inner hair cells here. Here's the hairs. The stereocilia are embedded into the underside of the tectorial membrane. So when a sound, when a traveling wave occurs along the basilar membrane, you've got a shearing action taking place. The hairs get bent because the whole floor lifts. And the way to think of it is almost like instead of my two hands bending like this, it's not really because that would show one hinge at the, at the heels of my hand. It's not. It's and so if I had elastic bands in my fingers, and I was doing this, the elastic bands would, would bend. And it's that action that is shown right here because there are two hinges, one here and one here. And that's, my, that's like my hands doing this, okay? And when that happens, the hairs get sheared and that bending action sends information, electrical information up to the eighth nerve along to the brain. So basically, and the hairs are surrounded by endolymph fluid, endolymph fluid, whereas the cell bodies themselves are surrounded by 
cortilymph fluid. Now, just for the heck of it, I can really open it. I can I can open up your anatomy notes so we can really look at that a little bit better. So I'll do that right here. I'll go to good old OTC down here. I'll go into 120 and we'll look at inner ear anatomy and I'll just pull up that just so we can really make sure we've got that down. Okay, here's the anatomy slides. Okay, something like this. We looked at this slide here and we said this whole area is filled with endolymph. And so endolymph is filling all where my cursor is. The hairs are touching endolymph. You see, there's the tectorial membrane. Endolymph is touching the hairs, whereas the cell bodies themselves, if I pull this closer, the cell bodies themselves are surrounded by perilymph inside the scala media. Remember, this is perilymph here. This is perilymph in, in here. So you got the scala vestibuli, perilymph, the scala tympani, perilymph, scala media, endolymph, but there's perilymph surrounding the cell bodies. That's what I mean by pillory. They're locked so that perilymph is here, here, surrounding the cell bodies, whereas endolymph is touching the hairs. If we go to the next slide, Okay, same thing. You can see the same thing here. Endolymph fluid, which would surround, which would be crawled up right where my cursor is going, which touches the hairs, whereas cortilymph is filled here, and cortilymph is perilymph inside the scala media. This is how the hair cells can change motion into electricity, just like a battery. <clears throat> A battery has two different kinds of metal in it, or two different kinds of fluid in it, which creates an electrical charge. So base, that's, that's essentially, but the, the, the hair cells are transducing that motion-like energy into electrical energy. All right, so back to the notes here. Good. And we'll read this paragraph again. All sounds entering the cochlea. Ah, stop here. Sounds don't enter the cochlea. This man, Kemp, was just explaining it to the lay public. And to the lay public, that's what they can understand. You and I, we know that sound waves don't enter the cochlea, okay? We know that the piston-like energy of the middle ear creates ripple waves in the cochlea. But those ripple waves are traveling waves, and they are not sound waves. And again, remember, if you unroll the cochlea, it's one inch long. Take a 250 hertz tone, that's four and a half feet long. So 250 hertz isn't going to get inside. Sound waves don't get inside. Okay, knowing that, all sounds entering the cochlea travel in a ripple wave along the basilar membrane, which is the traveling wave, which goes from the base to the apex. The waves go way slower than sound in air, taking a few milliseconds to complete a journey of a few millimeters over the hair cells. Each individual frequency wave grows as it travels up the cochlea, eventually reaching a peak before coming to a complete stop at a unique place along the basilar membrane. We talked about von Beckesy was the Harvard researcher who discovered the traveling wave. He had a colleague named Gold. I said last week that Gold and von Beckesy didn't really get along. Okay, Gold had said that, hmm, and we'll just tell the story here. It's rather interesting. And again, we'll just kind of go there at the very beginning here. Home, know your three names. Helmholtz discovered that the cochlea had a series of resonators. He didn't know about traveling waves, but he knew that mass, <clears throat> excuse me, that mass resonated with stiffness and that or mass resonates with lows and stiffness resonates with highs. And he said, at the base of the cochlea, the basilar membrane is smallest. It has least mass and is more stiff. At the apex of the cochlea, the basilar membrane is wider. It has more mass and it's less stiff. Therefore, the cochlea is tonal 
topic. Specific frequencies are represented in specific places. So when a low pitch sound reaches our ear, the basilar membrane is activated at the apex of the cochlea. Why? Because it has more mass. High pitches touch the ear, the basilar membrane hair cells are activated at the base of the cochlea. Why? Because the basilar membrane has less mass and is more stiff. He didn't know about traveling waves, but he did talk about the pad, about the ear, the inner ear, the basilar membrane as being a series of resonators. Okay? Now, uh, 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 von Beckesy, he discovered the traveling waves. Along the same thing as Helmholtz, but he discovered that the tra that, that was traveling waves that did this, and that the waves would ripple the basilar membrane at the base or the middle or the apex. He won his Nobel Prize for that, as we showed last week. Okay? Now, then came, and this is von Beckesy again, and then came Gold, who was way ahead of his time, and I had said last week that, or the week before even, that von Beckesy built this great big model in his laboratory at Harvard University, a model of the cochlea. And it didn't really work very well. He said it worked way better if he put the foot plate of the stapes in the round window. Then he could create beautiful traveling waves that would ripple up and down. Gold said, yeah, you know what, though? Maybe it's the outer hair cells that are doing something. And because they look different from inner hair cells. They're thin and like long, like test tubes, and outer inner hair cells are fat couch potatoes. So they look different from each other. And if they look different, they might do different things. And von Beckesy waved them off. Nah, what do you know? Go away. I won the Nobel Prize. You go away. Later on, it turns out that gold was right. Outer hair cells are doing something. So... Later on, we find out, here's a picture of gold again as an old man, okay? He was found to be right by this guy. Kemp is the one who wrote this paragraph, okay? And Kemp is the one who discovered that outer hair cells are doing something in the cochlea. Very important. So let's look at how the traveling wave works and make sure we have this picture down right here. How does it work? And we're talking about two motions here, a horizontal motion and a vertical motion in the cochlea. A horizontal motion and a vertical motion. So let's take a peek at our PowerPoint to find out how. And in this picture you will see a cochlea, close up. And you can see the red arrows, scala vestibuli, scala vestibuli, scala vestibuli, down through the helicotrema, scala tympani, scala tympani, scala tympani in green. A close-up of the same thing. I call this arrow here and that arrow here the horizontal back and forth movement. The movement made by the foot plate of the stapes pushing in and out of the oval window. This is the vertical movement. The whole bending of that scala media to cause the hair cells to shear, as we were talking about earlier, with one pivot joint right here where my cursor is and another pivot point right there. And here's the hairs, the stereocilia in between. All right, a sideways picture. <laughs> okay, and here's a, a, a schematic, foot plate of the stapes pushing in and out of the oval window right here. Scala vestibuli, follow the cursor, around the helicotrema, pushing out the scala tympani and bulging the round window out. So this forward and backward motion, I call the vertical, I mean the horizontal movement. But that horizontal movement creates a vertical movement, and that is done because the helicotrema is narrow. And because it's narrow, this whole body of fluid gets squished. It's, uh, there's a pressure buildup because it can't get around that corner so easily. So something has to give. And what gives is the scala media. Think of the black line as being the scala media. And the black line bends up and down. And that is shown if you take a cross section. Here's the square. Take a cross section. You're looking at this. 
Okay, so that's the that's that horizontal versus vertical motion. Out of a nursing textbook, here's the cochlea unrolled. Okay, boring. Okay, showing you here that high frequencies stimulate the base, high frequencies, low frequencies stimulating the apex of the cochlea, mid frequencies stimulating hair cells along the middle. Once again, the base of the cochlea, the middle of the cochlea, and the apex of the cochlea with the low frequencies. Showing you once again the vertical and horizontal movement. Horizontal, around the helicotrema, out. Horizontal, the big black arrows, causing this vertical motion. That is the traveling wave. Wherever the traveling wave peaks, it creates that vertical motion. Showing you once again in another slide, malleus incastapes, mechanical motion, pushing in the fluid around the helicotrema out to bulge the round window, and that in turn might cause an indentation here or an indentation here or wherever, and that indentation is the traveling wave stimulating either high-frequency hair cells, mid-frequency hair cells, or low-frequency hair cells. Once again here, showing the same thing. Kind of a good picture. I quite like this picture. Kind of a nice drawing of the middle ear anyway. Foot play to the stapes, the horizontal movement going out, and the vertical motion taking place at some unique spot along the basilar membrane. Much as Kemp had said here. Eventually reaching a peak before coming to a complete stop at a unique place along the basilar membrane, the traveling wave. Okay, here we have it. So, moving right along, wherever that traveling wave does occur, you've got that shearing action shown here. Here's one pivot point, here's the other pivot point, and therefore a bending of the hairs. Similarly shown there. Now we're talking about the, the traveling wave shape itself, and we said last week, and we'll highlight it again this week. The traveling waves are asymmetrical. They're not like little diamonds. They're shaped like kites. They have a steep front and a longer tail. So this is the cochlea unrolled, the base, high frequencies here, apex, lows there, and the traveling wave might stop here, you'll hear 2,000 hertz. If it stops here, you hear 200 hertz. But by gum, the envelope, the shape of the wave is asymmetrical. Again, showing another schematic here, and this is a good picture because it's showing you the apex of the cochlea, the basilar membrane is widest. Think of this whole thing as the scala media. So you've got fluid around inside here, okay? And notice that the basilar membrane, the pink area, is widest at the apex of the cochlea, narrowest at the base. But always remember, the base of the cochlea, where my cursor is here, is actually bigger and the apex of the cochlea is actually smaller. It goes exactly backwards to what you think. So the base of the cochlea, if you look at my cursor here, this bigger area has a narrower scala media, and the tippy top of the cochlea has a wider scala media. And that's what Helmholtz was talking about. More mass, less stiff here, less mass, more stiff here which is why he called the scala media a series of resonators. Von Beckesy took it a step further and said, well, it's actually waves that cause ripples in that basilar membrane. But you are right, Helmholtz. If it's a high-frequency sound, the wave will resonate with the stiffness. If it's a low-frequency sound entering or activating the ear, the wave will terminate at the apex because that's where the wave will resonate with the basilar membrane at the apex. Again, shown here, a schematic. Here's your, how do you like these for semicircular canals? Anyway, a low-frequency sound makes a low-frequency traveling wave. 
A mid-frequency sound makes the traveling wave stop here. A high-frequency sound makes the traveling wave stop here. But either way, the shape of the wave envelope is asymmetrical. Highlighted again in this slide, and these are showing you the wave envelopes. All this slide here is showing you is these dotted lines here. So if you follow the shape of these dotted lines, you're looking here now. A high frequency wave, a mid frequency wave, and a low frequency wave. The front of each wave is steep. The tail of the wave slopes back. And the front, the steep front of the wave always faces the apex, always faces north, is always facing the low frequencies, just as shown here. Okay? And here we talked about last week a whole bunch of traveling waves in the word information. Just saying the word information. And you can say that in loud and low frequency vowels, mm, okay, the traveling waves are stopping near the apex. In high frequency, small little traveling waves. For me, high frequency traveling waves. Shun, low frequency traveling waves. The apex is all along my cursor here. And the base of the cochlea is along my cursor here. And the only reason this goes down is showing time, what happens over time. But this is the cochlea unrolled, one inch long, showing you multiple traveling waves taking place with the simple saying of the word information. We talked about the shape of that traveling wave being asymmetrical, shaped like a kite. That highlights the thought of the upward spread of masking. Upward spread of masking. Put a star by this puppy, okay? Because lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Doesn't have much to do with Halloween. That was yesterday, okay? But masking means to cover one sound with another. So look at these two traveling waves. You'll see the red one here, and you'll see a light blue one here. The red one, this is the apex of the cochlea. You can see this on the left. This is the cochlea unrolled. Think of the black line as the basilar membrane upon which all the hair cells are standing. You're causing a peak of a traveling wave in the low frequencies. These hair cells will be stimulated. If the traveling wave stops here, these hair cells are stimulated. Now, what do we mean by the upward spread of masking? Well, we'll talk about that in just a bit. Look at what the outer hair cells are doing. No matter where the traveling wave stops, the outer hair cells are doing two things. They are amplifying. Look at the dotted lines here, the little dotted peaks. They are amplifying and they are sharpening. They are amplifying and sharpening the peaks of the traveling waves. And let's see if I've got a good little picture of that. And we did last week. Let's look at that picture once again. It would be rather good to highlight that one. I wonder if I've got that, though. That should be in here. Yeah, here it is. I knew we have it. Oh, okay. And you're looking at this action of what the outer hair cells are doing. They are stretching and shrinking. When they shrink, they pull this membrane down, that blue tectorial membrane down, so that those inner hair cell hairs can get sheared. This action of the outer hair cells results in two things. You see, if sounds are greater than 50 dB, there's enough fluid motion taking place in the cochlea to wiggle these hairs. But if sounds are less than 50 dB, the outer hair cells get a message from the brain to shrink and pull this tectorial membrane down to move the hair cells. Again, if the sound is greater than 50, no problem. The outer hair cells aren't active. But if the sound is less than 50, the outer hair cells are kicked into action to help the inner hair cells. Always remember, the inner hair cells are afferent. The inner hair cells send all sound info to the brain. Without them, you're deaf. 
but the inner hair cells have a fundamental flaw. They can't pick up sounds below 50. So if you lose outer hair cells, you have a 50 dB hearing loss. Okay? If you have healthy hair cells, you can hear all the way down to zero. If you lose outer hair cells, you can't hear till 50. Moderate hearing loss. And then you start losing inner hair cells. Now your hearing loss starts to get severe. So people who have 80 dB hearing loss, they have inner and outer hair cell damage. If people have a 50 decibel sensory neural loss, they just have outer hair cell damage. But what happens when you lose the outer hair cells is this. Go back over to the screen. You've lost. This magic ain't happening anymore. And as a result, you see, and here's the underside of the tectorial membrane. You can see where the hairs, if these black dots here are showing you, da, 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 da. so you'd have to tear that membrane off in order to see the underside of it like that, okay? And so what happened, where were we in this thing? If you've lost outer hair cells, you have a passive traveling waves. You've got all kinds of traveling waves, but they are round. Look at how round the peak is. So if this is really low frequencies and this is high frequencies, this guy's hearing a low frequency sound because the traveling wave peak is near the apex of the cochlea. And again, I'm going to highlight here, this is the basilar membrane. You might have one row of inner hair cells here, one row of inner hair cells all along here, three rows of outer hair cells, four rows of outer hair cells, five rows of outer hair cells. But always remember, the point of the cochlea is here, and the fat base of the cochlea is here. Okay, but without outer hair cells, your traveling waves are round. They're not sharp. That's the difference. So yes, you can still hear, but the amplitude of your traveling wave is smaller. Okay, you can't hear till sounds are about 50 dB. You haven't got this extra added amplitude given by the outer hair cells working their butts off by doing this. This action here changes this into this, okay? And those outer hair cells literally mechanically push that traveling wave to be sharper. So two things are occurring here. One is the amplitude is increased by the outer hair cells, but secondly, the sharpening is occurring by the outer hair cells. So this person has a better frequency resolution. He can distinguish between frequencies close together. Remember what we said in anatomy class. His differential F, his ability to, he needs bigger changes in frequency to recognize a change in frequency. His comb doesn't have a hundred teeth. His comb only has about 50 teeth. His piano doesn't have 88 keys. It's got 44 now. He's lost that fine tuning. And I guess that's really the central gist of it. As shown this way, a traveling wave, the outer hair cells amplify the wave and they sharpen it. So that's one thing to note about the physiology of the cochlea. And the second thing to note about the physiology of the cochlea is its asymmetrical shape. So the first thing is about the outer hair cells. What do they do? Two things, they amplify the wave and they sharpen it. Now with hearing aids, we can amplify, so we can make small traveling waves into bigger traveling waves, sure, no problem, but we can't sharpen. That's gone for good. So the person with a dull, rounded traveling wave has a hearing loss now because his wave is smaller, but he's also got more problems listening to speech and noise. He can't separate speech from noise as easily. I mean, if we go into a noisy bar, yep, it's harder for us to hear. But a person with hearing aids goes into a noisy bar, and he's got more problems than you and I do, even if he's properly aided. Something always to keep in mind. This is the situation here, an unrolled cochlea. And here's two traveling waves on the top sharpened and amplified by the outer hair cells. Just perfect. And now you've lost outer hair cells, the middle panel. So you've lost the sharpening and you've lost some amplitude. 
If you take hearing aids and put them on this person, you are making the traveling wave larger again, but that sharpening is gone. That's not there anymore. I like to say that's lost. We can't regain what went down with the flood. Okay, that's gone. And that's why the word hearing aid is a good word. It's an aid. It's not a new ear. And that's where counseling comes, comes so much into importance because you won't be describing this stuff to your clients. <laughs> I mean, you know it, I know it, but we're not talking to our clients about that. But the, what we do learn is, you know what? I can't make your hearing back like when you were 10. Okay, that's gone. But I can turn the clock back 10 years. Okay, I can help. I can make things better but I can't fix it. I can't. So when you think about hearing aids too, hearing aids have a twofold task. One, they need to provide gain or amplification. That's obvious, like duh, D-U-H, duh. But the second thing is they have to compensate for the loss of the sharpness. And how do we do that? For the person who can't separate frequencies close together. For the person whose traveling waves are now dull and rounded. For this guy here, he can't separate speech from background noise as easily. Well, guess what? The second thing hearing aids need to do is this. Increase the signal to noise ratio. Are we all familiar with what that means? Signal is the speech. Noise is the crap. So you want to increase the signal, the speech, compared to the noise so that the guy with the damaged hair cells can, C-A-N, can separate speech from noise. Okay? Because his traveling waves are dull and rounded. He can't separate frequencies close together. Let's help this guy out. Well, how can we do that? Well, let's deliberately make speech louder than noise. That way he can separate. It's almost like if you think of a, you think of a two lakes, one's high up and one's down here, and it's a waterfall going from the higher lake to the bottom lake. If a boat has to go from the top lake down to the bottom lake, how the heck is the boat going to get there? It can't. It has to go through a series of locks. It goes in, the water goes down, and then the lock opens and the boat can go through. Well, that's what hearing aids do. They have directional mics. They pick up sound in the direction the person is facing. And in that way, you do increase the signal to noise ratio. I'm going to put it this way. If the noise is 60 dB and the speech is 60 dB, they're even Steven. So the signal to noise ratio is zero. If the noise is 60 and the speech is 65, that's a 5 dB signal to noise ratio because the speech is 5 dB more than the noise. If the speech, if the noise is 60 and the speech is 55, that's 5 dB softer. So that means a minus 5 signal to noise ratio. SNR, signal to noise ratio means what was the decibels of speech compared to the noise? So hearing aids have to provide gain or amplification, duh, because the person has hearing loss. But second of all, hearing aids have to try and increase the signal to noise ratio. And they need to do that especially for sensory neural loss because sensory neural loss is death of outer hair cells. And death of outer hair cells means dull, rounded, traveling waves. So the person cannot separate frequencies close together. So he needs extra help in the form of directional microphones on a hearing aid to help increase the signal to noise ratio so that he can separate the speech from background noise. Quite the weird story, you know? It's uh, basically, I'm gonna just, we'll talk about the shape of that, uh, the, 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 the shape of the uh, traveling wave now. Let's focus on that, okay? Upward spread of masking. The traveling waves are asymmetrical. Now look at, this is the second part of cochlear physiology we need to really get our heads around, okay? The first part was that outer hair cell stuff. Here's the next part. The traveling waves are asymmetrical. Low frequencies make a big traveling wave near the apex. High frequencies make a traveling wave near the base. But as we said last week, 
Think of the, of the red traveling wave here as the wave made by the rumbling of a truck. Blah, 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 blah. And as we said last week, think of the high frequency traveling wave here as the soft peeping of a canary in your kitchen in a cage. Beep, 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 beep. The rumbling of a truck, notice how its envelope covers the envelope of the high frequency canary. That means this low frequency sound will mask the high frequencies. If you look at it the other way around, it won't work that way. Have a look at this picture. Now you've got the low frequency rumbling of a truck outside. Blah, 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 blah. And Miss Harry Canary, she can, as we said last week, she can beep, 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 till the cows come home. Her traveling wave isn't going to go out there. It's not going to ever mask this. This can happen, but this high frequencies will never mask that, the lows. Okay, and that is very important. It's called the upward spread of masking. The upward spread of masking. Lows mask highs better than highs mask lows. Why? Question mark. How come? Question mark. Because the traveling waves are asymmetrical in shape. That's why. They're shaped like kites. And the high frequency wave stops at the base. And that kite may be made very, very large, but it's hard pressed to push its way out to mask the low frequencies. It just doesn't happen. And what does that mean in our lives for counseling with hearing aids? Background noise is mostly low frequencies. Background hubbub, blah, 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 party babble, blah, 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 did you hear that, blah, 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 the traffic going by, meow, meow. mostly low frequency. What's the highs? The consonants, letters S, F, C, H, G. So we said before, noise is like the bull in the china shop, and the consonants are like the china teacups. And the bull can come in and smash to bits the china teacups. That's background noise can smash or cover the high frequency consonants like nobody's business. That's really physiologically due to the shape of that ding dong traveling wave. Strange stuff, but true. Okay, now if we go all the way down here, what have we? Where are we? Ah! We'll finish our section on physiology by talking about Oto acoustic emissions. Oto acoustic emissions. OAEs are a byproduct of the outer hair cells working their butts off. If you work hard, you sweat. Sweat is a byproduct of physical work. If you touch a light bulb, it's hot. The heat is a byproduct of the light bulb. The main purpose of the light bulb is to provide light, but a byproduct of it is the extra heat. OAEs are a byproduct of the outer hair cells working. Whoa, I pushed the wrong button there. Okay, don't get a seizure by looking at the screen too fast here. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. They are a byproduct of the outer hair cells doing this. This work being done by the outer hair cells creates autoacoustic emissions. It's work done inside the cochlea, and the byproduct is OAEs. Autoacoustic emissions are like the ear in reverse, literally. A backward traveling wave is caused, which hits the footplate of the stapes. Get this, hits the footplate of the stapes and wiggles the middle ear ossicles and makes the eardrum work like a little speaker. So it's the ear going backwards. The ear is actually producing sounds that are coming out, little tiny squeaks. We can't hear them. You know why we can't hear them? I'll show you why. Remember we talked about the middle ear and why we have a middle ear? And I had you hold your hand against your face. And I said, force over a big area, no problem. Push your hand against your, with force against your fingertip. Now oh, I got a white dot there, okay? Way more pressure. 
Pressure is force over an area. That's why you have the middle ear. Well, if sounds are going backward, you're going on to a bigger area. Instead of a force on a, a large area, squeezing onto a small one, thereby increasing the pressure, now you're going backwards. So because you're going backwards, you lose sound pressure. And you can't hear your OAEs. That's why you don't hear them. Your autoacoustic emissions are measured at about minus 10 dB SPL. Minus. They're very soft. Thank God, otherwise we'd be hearing them. Never confuse autoacoustic emissions with tinnitus or ringing in the ear. Different, different, different animals. Okay, different things. You'll learn more about tinnitus in your counseling course. And that's only the person who hears that is the person who's got it. But that's not a physical sound. Like a doctor can't go in and listen and hear your tinnitus. Okay? Tinnitus comes from the brain. It's an imagined sound, but it's not real. Autoacoustic emissions are real. They can actually take a probe and put it in the ear. And you can measure them. And if you can't find them, it means the person has no outer hair cells. If autoacoustic emissions are present, it means you've got good, healthy, functioning outer hair cells. They use autoacoustic emissions to test babies in hospitals. Audiologists studying at Missouri State University in Springfield, okay, they learn autoacoustic emissions. It's also a great test for people who are lying about their hearing levels. You can do autoacoustic emissions to show if they've got normal healthy hair cells or not. They put a probe in your ear, and the probe has a little speaker, and tones come into the ear. You're creating two traveling waves. They put two tones in the ear. You're creating two traveling waves, and a third one, look at that little dot one, comes back out. The traveling wave, the emission goes this way, out wiggling the middle ear ossicles and the eardrum is acting like a speaker and the microphone picks up the sound weird a speaker one and two into your ear canal middle ear inner ear two tones come into the ear this is how they do it they put two tones in the ear they're split by a certain ratio we won't go into it and then the cochlear outer hair cells produce an auto acoustic emission which travels back through the middle ear out of the ear canal and gets picked up by the mic. And this is the probe that's put into your ear. This whole speaker one, two, and three is this system right here. So two tones come out. They're related in terms of frequency. They have to be a certain ratio apart. And a third sound comes back out. That's your autoacoustic emission. Here again, showing you two tones put into the ear. This isn't showing you traveling waves. This is just showing you the a spectrum of the two tones. And then this is the autoacoustic emission. This is the noise floor in your ear canal. And this is the two tones in your ear canal. And this is showing you the autoacoustic emission that's picked up by the microphone. Here again, same thing. Weird but true. So this was from a male who was 41 years old. This was me some years ago. This was my hearing. And I had autoacoustic emissions across all the frequencies and then they died over at this one here. And sure enough, it's because I was losing some high frequency hearing, you can just see. Anyway, so basically, hearing aids here, I'm just gonna show you a picture how we can finalize this little section on cochlear physiology. Look, at, take a good look at this graph. This will be on the final exam. This is very important. Here you have zero decibels going up to 100. Here you have on this axis is one's perception of the decibels. So the red line shows normal hearing. To a normal hearing person, 10 or 20 decibels sounds soft. To a normal hearing person, 50 or 60 sounds comfortable. To a normal hearing person, 100 sounds too loud. Okay. Now take sensory neural hearing loss, outer hair cell damage. Now you're looking at the blue line. The person can't hear sounds below 50, right? Because of outer hair cell damage. So to him, 50 or 60 sounds very soft. And yet, 100 sounds too loud. 
Do you see what I'm showing here? With sensory neural loss, the ceiling of loudness tolerance didn't change. The floor of hearing sensitivity went up. Normally, you can hear from zero up to 100. But with outer hair cell damage, you now hear from 50 up to 100. Okay? It's not like I'm squeezing my two hands together. Uh-uh. Just my left hand went up. My floor of hearing sensitivity. Now I can't hear zero. I can't hear 10. I can't hear 20, 30, 40. Ah, now I'm 50. It's like me, instead of standing on the floor in this room and saying, oh, there's the ceiling. Now I'm standing on a table on the room, and the ceiling hasn't changed. Okay, so now my hearing sensitivity is the level of the table, but the ceiling hasn't gone up. So, because of that, that's why you can't go up to someone who's deaf and scream in his ear. Because if you do, he's going to wind up and punch you in the side of the head. Okay, because 100 dB sounds just as loud to him as it does to you. His trouble is he just can't hear soft sounds. But loud sounds, exactly the same. It's really weird. It's because of that weird graph. Look at the graph really carefully. Okay? The lines meet at 100. Now, look at the arrows. The arrows mean the hearing aid has to amplify soft sounds by a lot, average sounds by less, and loud sounds by little or nothing at all. Here's a picture, here's another picture showing you. Here's a typical sensory neural hearing loss. Outer hair cell death, mostly in the high frequencies. Good hearing in the low frequencies, you can hear like at 15, but poorer hearing in the high frequencies. Now you're looking at it in terms of DB, SPL. SPL here. Here's that bottom curve, and look, his floor of hearing has gone up. But the loudness ceiling tolerance hasn't changed. So his dynamic range is smaller. What is dynamic range? The decibel distance between your floor and your ceiling. The decibel distance between my feet, and I'll, show, I'll stop sharing here again, dynamic range. The decibel distance between my feet on the floor and my head at the ceiling, that's my decibel distance, okay? For a normal hearing person, it's about at least 100. I can hear from zero up to 100. With hearing loss, I can't hear until, say, 50. And now my dynamic range is only 50 because 100 minus 50 is 50, okay? So what happens with sensory neural loss is the dynamic range decreases. And dynamic range in English just means the decibel distance between the floor of your hearing sensitivity and the ceiling of your loudness tolerance. What is total deafness? It means that the floor met the ceiling. So there's no dynamic range. You either can't hear it, and as soon as you do hear it, it hurts. Okay? So... And with worse hearing loss, my dynamic range is smaller. With worse hearing loss, it's even smaller. So that's why hearing aids use something called compression. Hearing aids amplify soft sounds by a lot. And I'll go back here. Soft sounds by a lot. And loud sounds by little or nothing at all. That partially explains the cost of hearing aids. Imagine an amplifier that's constantly changing the amount by which it's amplifying. If I speak really softly, the hearing aid is working its tail off. If I start to talk louder, the hearing aid automatically backs off. How come? Because loud sounds are heard just as loud by people with normal hearing as they are by people with hearing loss. And true deafness means that the floor has met the ceiling. Now, I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. I remember going to a, a convention in the States, may have even been in Missouri. I don't even remember. It could have been in St. Louis. And I was testing myself on an audiometer just for fun, and I was playing an ultra-high frequency sound. I was playing like 15,000 hertz, which is way, way high up in pitch. And I turned that up to 60, 
Couldn't hear it 70, couldn't hear it 80, couldn't hear it 90, couldn't hear it 100. Oh, that hurt. Felt like a pin in my ear. Back to 90, couldn't hear it. 95, couldn't hear it. 100, oh, okay. Make it one dB steps. 96, 97, uh, began to feel a tingle. 98, uh, felt like a shark. Okay, I have no dynamic range. See what I mean? I couldn't hear it, and in one minute I did hear it, it hurt. That means that the floor met the ceiling. That means that at 15,000 hertz, I'm deaf, which is normal. Because normal, you can hear up to 20,000 hertz but if you're a baby, but by the time you're 10, you can't hear 20,000 hertz anymore. By the time you're 20, you can't hear 18,000 hertz anymore. By the time you're 30, you can't hear 15,000 hertz anymore. It really hurts, okay? So as you increase in decades, you lose your treble, and finally when you hit 65, it in starts to invade the audiometric test frequencies like 4,000 hertz, 8,000, and that's why most people have high-frequency hearing loss, okay? So now we'll go to our notes here because we're about done, and I just want to make sure that we've, got, uh, that we've covered what we needed to cover, but I think we did. Okay, escape. Get out of this, Ted. Okay, find the notes here. Look at their notes. Look at the notes. <clears throat> okay, the stapes unrolled and cross section. We've covered all of that. We talked about traveling waves versus sound waves. Put a star by that. Read this carefully on page two. Just have a read of it. It's all of what I said. Think about it. A 250 hertz tone has a wavelength of four and a half feet. There's no way it's going to get inside of a cochlea. Okay. Sound waves are longitudinal waves. Traveling waves are transverse waves. That's what this is about. Next section talks about the asymmetrical traveling wave. Put a star by that section. That's called the upward spread of masking. It talks about the truck versus the canary. Next, the shearing action of the stereocilia seen close up. Now, over here, I'll tell you FNO, freak not out. I couldn't care less about this stuff that I'm highlighting right there. Depolarization, hyperpolarization, don't worry about it. That's FNO for nerds only, okay? Doesn't matter. Here, put a star by that. Traveling wave and the two-fold roll of outer hair cells. They amplify and they sharpen. No kidding. I think we hammered that puppy down pretty good. We talked about Von Beckesy and gold. Here you go. That's where it's highlighted. Have a read. It's all in there. Outer hair cells are the active cochlear mechanism. Okay? They sharpen the traveling wave. Otherwise, the traveling wave is just passive. It occurs at the base, at the middle, at the apex. That's a rounded, dull traveling wave. That's a passive wave. And then we, and, and outer hair cells actively sharpen it. And we talked about autoacoustic emissions and hearing it and, and uh, outer hair cells. Okay, there we go. Covered that. We talked a bit about that. Oh, by the way, non behavioral is a good word to know. Non behavioral means you didn't voluntarily make a response, it's just happened in your ear. You had no choice. You're not raising a hand. If you're raising a hand when you hear a tone, that's called a behavioral test. If you're answering back speech in a speech test, you're, that's behavioral because you're voluntarily answering back. Autoacoustic emissions happen. They either happen or they don't happen, but you don't have any control over it. Non-behavioral, okay? Okay, this has a lot to do with hearing aids. Wide dynamic range compression. In other words, in English, outer hair cells amplify soft sounds. So what hearing aids try and do is they try to imitate outer hair cells. Because the outer hair cells amplify soft sounds below 50 dB, well, guess what? Hearing aids imitate that by doing this. Hearing aids amplify soft sounds by a lot, and they amplify loud sounds by little or nothing at all. The word to use for that is called wide dynamic range compression. They're trying to shrink a big dynamic range into a smaller dynamic range. A normal dynamic range of 100 dB into a smaller dynamic range of 50 dB. 
Why? Because of outer hair cells. And because outer hair cells amplify soft sounds by the most, guess what? The hearing aids use wide dynamic range compression to imitate the outer hair cells. How? By amplifying soft sounds by a lot and loud sounds by little or nothing at all. That, in all essence, is the shape of physiology of the inner ear. It really is quite something. It's uh, just for the sheer heck of it. Have you, have you ever looked up on the internet? I'm going to close this down. I want to try something here. Have you ever looked up on the internet? Let's just try this. I'll go in Google Chrome. And why don't I look up traveling wave um what do you call it uh youtube let's see what we got here traveling waves let's see if we can find a good one here because i did have one traveling wave youtube music Maybe, 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 maybe it'll pop up. I had that noise. It was such a good one a while ago that popped up. But let's see what this one does. Just see once what it does. See what it shows. Oh boy, that's boring. Ah, uh, you know what? I don't think I want to do that. You're listening to ads here. That's no good. <laughs> But I'm, I'm going to just, let's see if I can find that traveling wave one. I'm going to, I'm going to try and, and, and send that to you too, just, just because it's uh, really quite interesting. Ooh, using springs as a medium? No, not that. I want to just, traveling waves. I'm going to go back here. Let's see if I can try a different one. Okay. Cochlear traveling waves. Try this one once. It's kind of cool. Oh, brother, that's getting really boring. No, I'm going to find you. Now, I guess this little experiment didn't quite work, but I wanted to show you on YouTube because it is pretty cool. It's what you, it's what you can actually see. Anyway, I'll stop sharing screen here. Basically, we've covered most of it, but Google up traveling waves and watch how they work. I guess that's what I'm trying to encourage you to do because I can talk about it all I want, but to see actual motion going on, I encourage, especially young people, you Google me out of the world. Out of, I mean, you guys are on there all the time. Check it out and look for yourself to see if you can get motion shots of traveling waves in the cochlea. And if I find the particular um, URL or the particular site of the one that I'm thinking of, I'm going to make sure to send it all to you because you've got to look at it. It's cool. Anyway, with that thought, cheers. Let's get out of here. I think we've been in this, time, this class for even now more than an hour. Well, it's sort of about just about an hour here. I'll stop recording. There's no Zoom session next week. Okay, what we're going to do when we come back in two weeks is we're going to cover a bit of some disorders of the inner ear, and then we'll move to the end of the course. All right, Perfect. make sure you read your notes well. Do listen to this Zoom session. Boy, I hope that people have. We've covered it now for about three weeks. But know the main salient points, the asymmetrical wave, the twofold role of the outer hair cells, Helmholtz, von Beckesy, gold, the active traveling wave versus the passive traveling wave. And here's how I'll sign off. I always tell about OTC. You know how you have, how you have online programs? Some of them I call passive online programs. Because they, you know, you do your assignments and then you hit send and the instructor or whatever grades your assignment and then sends it back to you. There's no communication really. It's just back and forth online training. Well, here's OTC. We have active Zoom sessions. So I call OTC an active online program as opposed to a passive online program. You can have an active traveling wave or a passive traveling wave. Well, I think OTC is an active online program. Okay, Venema, shut up. Go home now. All right, see you, Sam, and anyone else who's been watching this. Cheers.